How does Kapanlisip differ from Idelalisip in its mechanism of action? So there are, um, there are several different isoforms of PI3 kinase. Um, and the Idelalisip hits mainly the delta isoform, and the uh, drug Kapanlisip uh, is a pan PI3 kinase inhibitor. It tends to hit uh, alpha and delta isoforms uh, more so than the other isoforms. It uh, also is given IV versus the idelizib, which is given orally. Uh, so um, these differences, I uh, meaning the differences in the isoforms that hit, hits also lead to a slightly different side effect profile with capanilizib compared to idelizib. But what's the rationale for targeting both the alpha and the delta? PI3 kinase is a regulator of multiple cellular processes, everything from survival to chemo resistance to genomic stability. And it looks like alpha uh, probably is involved or is more prevalent in resistant um, follicular lymphomas. And so maybe, you know, hitting alpha is going to be uh, better when you're looking at patients that have progressed after multiple lines of therapy. Uh, it may also be involved, as I mentioned, in chemo resistance and involved in cellular signaling uh, within the microenvironment. The Kronos 1 study was in large part responsible for this accelerated approval. What were the data from that study? So it's a single arm phase two trial in, in, in a way you can say double refractory. So patients required at least two prior regimens, failed alkylating agents and rituximab, and treated with single agent uh, uh, copanlisib. Um, the response rate is pretty good, uh, close to 60%, I think about 58% response rate. Mm -hmm. CR rate in, with these agents usually not high, but that's okay because the PFS is, is pretty good, about one year and sometimes exceeds one year. Same thing for duration of response. So as single agent, um, it, it in, in, in the third line space, it looks like probably like rituximab as single agent in the old days. 50% uh, response rate was for rituximab with about one year uh, PFS. So it's, it's pretty These are people who already failed rituximab. Exactly, but exactly right. Yes. <coughs> but how do these results compare with Idella? Well, almost the same, actually. It's just very comparable uh, compared to idolism. But the, so the, the difference mainly is really the, the, uh, the safety profile. That's what the major difference between them. Yeah, so what's the difference in the safety profile? Well, we saw with idolism, um, there was a significant portion of patients who developed both acute and late colitis. Uh, there were also a couple cases in pneumonitis and in the uh, some of the registration or randomized studies, there appeared to be a significant signal with regards to actually infections, significant infections. With copanilizib, we see a slightly less or slightly lower incidence of colitis, um, but we do see transient hyperglycemia and hypertension, uh, which we did not see in the idelalizib studies. Luckily, in most of the cases of hyperglycemia, it resolved. Uh, most of the patients did not require significant intervention. In fact, uh, many times uh, we really don't recommend insulin because the drug will still be on board and patients can develop a delayed hypoglycemia. Uh, so again, hypertension, fairly transient around two hours, and hyperglycemia, also transient and not too significant in most patients, lasted around five to eight hours. So again, I think this is probably has to do with the different isoforms. Um, the infectious risk, uh, to be fair, I, I think it's hard to know yet until we see more data with copanilizib. The infectious risk <laughs> with idelalizib really didn't come out. Uh, we didn't really truly understand it until we ran randomized studies, and that's when we saw, again, an increased risk uh, compared to uh, non idelalizib arms. Well, the other issue with idella <coughs> was that the median time to follow up in the Gopal study, which was the major publication, was six months. Sure. And we didn't see the colitis and all that stuff until mm -hmm. after that. The median follow-up in the Kronos study is about the same, if I'm not mistaken. So I think we need longer follow-up to make sure. The publication would suggest that even though you are seeing colitis, you are seeing pneumonitis, you're seeing dermatitis and transaminase, all the itises, mm -hmm. it seems to be, and hopefully is a lower frequency than, than the other ones. Um, the schedule of administration, though, 
as you said, one pill twice a day versus mm -hmm. day one, eight, 15, a week off indefinitely. Do you envision that being an issue with patient compliance or something else? Well, um, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. I think compliance, it's hard to know because sometimes uh, you know, having a scheduled visit once a week and you set it up on a whatever it is a Monday during lunch and you're coming every Monday and it becomes a routine thing maybe the compliance can actually be better with a drug that's given at the doctor's office on a, on a routine schedule than with oral drugs and we've seen with many other oral drugs across the spectrum of diseases I can think of HIV for example where um, unfortunately sometimes in, in an oral drug that's given daily there's a lot of missed doses uh, with regards to the usage of the drug, I think that's going to be hard to know. Uh, we've talked earlier about uh, academic medical centers where many patients are coming in from out of town. Clearly, a drug that's given weekly uh, is difficult if you're traveling from Little Rock, Arkansas to New York City to get your drug. It, it's really pretty much inconceivable that you can make that trip weekly um, indefinitely. Uh, so an oral drug in that kind of setting is, is clearly easier for patients. How this is going to translate into community practices where patients are not traveling too far, I think it's, it's, it's hard to know yet. No. No, I, again, there's, I think there's advantages and disadvantages for everything. There's the advantage of, of having an IV is the, some patients like to see their physicians once mm -hmm. a week. They feel more secure. You're keeping an eye on them because now they're coming every week. You're checking on side effects. You're asking them, do you have cough? Do you have diarrhea? Do you have so you can detect toxicities early on and act on it early on. Whereas if you give them like one pills to take home, disappear for two months and come back, maybe it's too late because they kept taking it, ignoring the side, side effects and symptoms, and then they get more into trouble. So yes, it, from convenience point of view, the IV a little bit more inconvenience. I think from a safety issue, it may actually add some safety value mm -hmm. for this, uh, for this uh, drug. 